Okay, good morning, everybody. Sorry, I'm a bit late. Uh, <laughs> running late this morning. Um, can everybody see the screen? <clears throat> and yes, we are recording. <clears throat> okay, here is a verse. Can you see the verse now um, on the screen? Everybody can see? Yep. Okay. Just let me know in the chat box. Yeah, okay, good. So the verse says like this, they came to Mara, that was the name of a place, but they could not drink the waters because they were bitter. Now, just let me explain what the context is. <clears throat> the context is um, that the Jewish people had already come out of Egypt and they were on their way now to the Holy Land, to the land of Israel. They had not yet received the Torah. They were just out of Egypt. And this was one of the journeys that they made, the journey to Mara. Now, altogether, there were, in fact, 42 journeys from Egypt all the way to the Holy Land. The Baal Shem Tov, the famous um, founder of um, the Hasidic path in Kabbalah, Hasidism. So the Baal Shem Tov explained that these 42 journeys are listed here because the same 42 journeys happen in every person's life. In other words, from the moment that he leaves Egypt, which could be the moment of his birth or the moment of his sort of spiritual awakening, until the time that he comes to the Holy Land, until the time that he comes to the ultimate goal, we can trace the 42 journeys in a person's life as well. So therefore, every, every, uh, every part of the journey, every section of the journey is obviously critical in understanding how it is that we, um, uh, how it is that we overcome the challenges and the difficulties that we experience, or how it is that we increase and, um, and uh, emphasize the positive and the beautiful things in our lives. So it's important, therefore, to understand this particular journey is one of them. The title of this class was um, Sweetening the Harsh Aspects of Life, or sometimes you could say the harsh realities of life. If there are realities, we'll see soon enough. Now, this verse over here that we're uh, about to explain is... Um, Again, one of those journeys, and when we understand a little bit better, then um, we'll have an insight into how to treat or how to deal with uh, issues in our own lives. So, it says that they came to Mara, the name of the place, but they could not drink the waters because they were bitter. Now, the straightforward understanding of this is that the waters were bitter. But the Magid Mizrich, the disciple and, for, and uh, subsequently the person who took the place of the Baal Shem Tov, the successor of the Baal Shem Tov, whose name was the Magid Mizrich, Rabbi Dov Ber Mizrich, uh, named after the place that he came from, Mizrich. So Rabbi Dov Ber of Mizrich, or the Magid Mizrich, explains, no, don't say that it's because they were bitter, the waters were bitter, it's because they, the people, were bitter. They came to Mara, but they could not drink the waters because they were bitter. They could not drink the life-giving, the sustaining water, the water that we all need, the water, water for the water for the soul. There's a verse that says, "Like cold water for a thirsty soul." So their souls could not drink the water over there because they, the people, were bitter. And that, in fact, very often happens that we can't get to what we need as the life-sustaining uh, water for our souls because we're in a state of bitterness, in a state of, uh, of, of, uh, a state of negativity, in a state of sadness or depression or, um, or, or hopelessness or feelings of, uh, I just, I can't, I can't get out of the rut that I'm in. Now, the truth is that bitterness, in, um, in, especially in Hasidic terminology, is not necessarily a negative term. Bitterness is not the same as depression. Uh, it's not the same as anger. Bitterness is the result of looking at, looking at where I'm at 
and concluding that I'm not where I should be. It's a positive thing. It's a thing that energizes. It's bitterness is something that energizes rather than um, uh, rather than holds you back, rather than prevent uh, prevent you from doing what you need to do. So bitterness is has its positive qualities, but we'll understand how shortly. So what happens next is that um, I hope I'm recording here. Just one second. Uh, yeah. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, um, this concept, therefore, of, uh, of, of bitterness has its uh, positive qualities and has its uh, positive side. Now, when they came to Mara and they were bitter and they could not drink the waters over there, so um, they came to discuss the issue and says they came to complain, but uh, we don't have to understand it's complain, but just they came to report the issue to Moses. And what, is, uh, what does Moses do? As he always does, he consults God. What, what should I do? So it says, by your who eats, God showed him a certain tree and he took the tree and he threw it into the water, and that sweetened the waters. <clears throat> now, the Medrash, the Medrash, uh, Medrash is a Medrash is a series of um, rabbinical teachings on the verses of the Bible, the verses of the Torah. So, one of the Midrashim, the Alkut Shemoni, actually. Um, explains that what happened was he took an aids, he took this, uh, this, this tree, and in what this tree, what this tree actually was, there are a number of different opinions. And these different opinions will give us an insight into the various approaches that can be taken to um, the concept of bitterness, how to deal with bitterness, how to deal with blockages, how to deal with um, things that seem to be holding us back in our lives. So what are the various opinions? One opinion was that it was simply a willow tree. It was a willow tree. And he took part of the willow tree, uh, a few branches or whatever, or a branch, and he threw it into the water that sweetened the water. A, uh, a second opinion says, no, it was an olive tree. It's not that they're arguing about what actually happened, but they're arguing about what approach we should take to life. Another one said it was an olive tree. An olive tree, as you know, olives themselves are very bitter. And apparently, according to the pundits, if you actually taste the leaves of an olive tree or the bark of an olive tree, it is also very bitter. A third opinion says it was an oleander bush that he threw into the water. Now, oleander, if everyone knows, oleander is actually poisonous, poisonous to humans. Um, and um, so that was a third opinion, that it was actually an oleander tree. A fourth opinion says it was some kind of sweet tree. In other words, something like sugarcane or whatever that he threw into the water, and that sweetened the waters. The final opinion, the opinion of the Zohar, uh, is that the tree doesn't refer to a tree at all. It refers to the tree of life. In other words, it refers to that aspect of, um, that aspect of life or that aspect of reality which energizes and sweetens and makes beautiful all of life. Where was the tree of life? The tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. So it took the tree of life or an aspect of the tree of life that got and threw it into the waters to and threw it into the water to sweeten the waters. Now let's talk about these uh, all of these individually and see how this works. So let's start off with the sweet tree, the sugar cane or whatever it was that he threw into the water. Question was, did the waters themselves 
now were they transformed into sweet water? And the answer is no, they weren't transformed into sweet water. It was just that the sweetness that was now in the water concealed the bitterness. The bitterness wasn't so bitter because there was sweetness. Just like uh, most of us like to put sugar in coffee, coffee itself is a bitter, uh, generally it's a, quite a bitter substance. But when you put um, sugar in it, so it covers the bitterness and you'll enjoy it together, the sweetness and the bitterness together kind of thing. But the sweetness usually covers the bitterness, at least to some extent, it takes the edge off it. And perhaps the same thing uh, in, in this particular case. The sweet tree uh, took the edge off the bitterness. Now, what does that mean in terms of they were bitter, not the waters were bitter, they themselves, the people were bitter. How do we deal with bitterness? Because we focus only on the positive. We focus on that which is sweet, on those, on the good things. Every person has in their lives, no matter how bad things might happen to be, but there are moments that are positive, perhaps in the present, perhaps in the past, and certainly moments that will be positive in the future. Now, different people have different uh, approaches to things. Some are much more past-oriented people, some are much more present-oriented, and others are more future-oriented, and some of us have a mix of all of them. Uh, so it depends. Or so maybe a mix of both of them. To be completely past-oriented is not living with the times. It's not the way things are supposed to be. To be completely future-oriented without thinking about um, uh, the present or the past is also not a, a very positive uh, way of dealing with things being only future oriented because we have to live in this world and we have to live now, not in the world to come, in the future. But in any event, a person can always find in his past and even in his present, his or her present, some positive aspects. And by focusing more on the positive than on the negative or focusing only on the positive and trying not to focus at all on the negative, so that sweetens the water. Doesn't mean that the negative has gone away though. The negative is still there. But it's overcome by changing your focus. If a person can't find anything in his past or his present which is uh, positive, so the person can then focus on, he or she can then focus on things that will be sweet in the future. Things that will be positive in the future. Only one has to make them that way. But in any event, it's a focus on the positive. That's the analogy of the sweet tree that sweetens up the, uh, the bitter water, the bitterness of the people. Let's look at one of the, at the opinions which all express the idea of the plant that was used was a plant which was not a sweet plant which sweetened up the waters, but was a plant which has... According to one opinion, it was an arava, a willow tree. Now, what about what is it about a willow tree? What's, what's unusual about a willow tree? And the answer is absolutely nothing. A willow tree is just a plain, ordinary tree. Um, they're very beautiful trees, actually, it's true. But, um, but the, uh, traditionally, the concept of a willow tree uh, is explained on Sukkot, the uh, festival which, which happens in the month of Tishrei, which is some September time usually. Um, so the, there is a mitzvah commandment in the Torah to um, take a palm branch and an etrog, a citron, and uh, hadasim, which is myrtle branches, and um, also two fronds from a willow and hold them all together and uh, wave them in various directions. And that is actually a, um, uh, it's a mitzvah commandment that is mentioned in the Torah. It's called Natilat Lulav. And it's uh, the taking of the Lulav, the Lulav is a palm branch, and various others together with it. In any event, there it is explained that the willow, each of, the, each of those various uh, types that are taken together, represent different types of people. The citron, for example, represents a person who is, has, um, is full, of, uh, full of wisdom, full of learning, full of uh, knowledge, and also has a pleasant smell. Pleasant, in other words, his deeds are 
pleasant. His deeds are positive. So a person who is learned and acts correctly is compared to the citron. A person who has only good deeds but doesn't necessarily have a lot of learning behind him is compared to the palm branch, a date, date palm, right? Um, a person who has, um, I'm sorry, he has only taste, he has only learning and not good deeds. I'm sorry, uh, the, the, the date palm has learning, has, has taste, which is comparable to learning. In Hebrew, the, the word ta'am also means reason, reasoning. He has reasoning compared to the date palm. Uh, the myr the uh, myrtle branches are um, people who have good deeds. There's a good, there's a beautiful smell that comes from the myrtle, a beautiful scent, aroma that comes from the myrtle branches, but not, they don't have uh, a lot of intelligence, a lot of knowledge. And the willow tree represents those type of people who don't have neither good deeds nor are they uh, learner, just ordinary, plain, ordinary. So the willow branch therefore represents that which is not particularly distinguished, not by good deeds and not by um, uh, the acquisition of knowledge and the acquisition of wisdom. So therefore, when the Midrash tells us that the one of the, um, the, one of the opinions in the Midrash is that the uh, willow branches were thrown and that's what made the water sweet, how did the willow branches make the water sweet? The, the, the lesson here is that a person should be able to look at himself honestly, himself, herself, honestly, and say, I haven't used the abilities that I have to, to, to go beyond myself, to, to make myself into something that I could be. I'm looking now at myself in the present, and I have not yet acquired a good scent because my deeds are not the way they ought to be, to be. In other words, I'm not causing my aroma to waft uh, around, all around me. I'm not doing deeds by which people, from, from which other people benefit. Good deeds. And I also haven't acquired much knowledge. When a person realizes where he's actually holding, and uh, that there's a lot of room for improvement, even though that's itself sort of a bitter reality, the bitterness sweetens the bitterness. The Talmud says that most, um, uh, that doctors generally cure by opposites. If a person is, um, is, sick with one particular thing with heat then they cool him down if he's sick with with cold and warm him up and so on and so forth but god heals like with like that's the that's the uh, what the talmud says in other words god heals can heal bitterness with bitterness so the same thing over here is sort of like uh, homeopathy right the origins of homeopathy in the uh, in the talmud um god heals like with like, in other words, bitterness with bitterness, he gives the instruction, the word for Yerei who ate, he showed him a tree, it means he instructed him regarding how you use the tree to change the bitterness into sweetness. By being bitter at your bitter situation, that can already sweeten the situation. That's one way of, uh, of sweetening things. That was the first opinion, a willow tree. Now, the next um, uh, example is the olive tree, an olive tree. Now, an olive tree is, as I said before, in, its, in and of itself, a bitter, it's a bitter tree. But the olive gives forth oil. And oil is comparable in the Torah. Shemen is shemen oil is always comparable, is always compared to the concept of wisdom. So therefore, when he throws the tree, if it's an olive tree that he throws into the water, that is telling us in order to heal the bitterness of the soul, one must acquire wisdom. The important thing is to acquire wisdom, to acquire shemen. And that, that wisdom is essentially the wisdom of the inner dimensions of the Torah, really the wisdom of Kabbalah. That's the way they explain it. That's the way they explain the concept of oil. Oil is that which gives light in the soul, right? 
Ner Hashem Nishmat Adam, God's candle is man's soul. God's candle is man's soul. So how does man's soul light up as God's candle? So there's another uh, statement of the sage, uh, there's another verse that says, my candle is in your hands, and your candle is in my hand. God, so to speak, speaking to the people and saying, my candle is in your hand and your candle is in my hand. Your candle is the soul, which is in my hand. But in order to light that up, I've given you my candle. My candle is the Torah. And particularly the inner dimension of the Torah is called the Or of the Torah. Right? The light of the Torah, which is hidden in the Torah and has to be unearthed. And that is really the secrets of the Torah. So the Zayat therefore represents the concept of acquiring wisdom. Acquiring wisdom means acquiring the inner secrets of the Torah. And that lights up the soul. A, another opinion when we talk about bitter is the concept of um, the oleander tree, or what's called in the Midrash the Hidofni bush, the oleander, which is actually a poisonous, um, as I mentioned before, a poisonous uh, tree. And um, how does that, how does that repair? How does that um, overcome the bitterness? So there is a, a very interesting Talmudic uh, teaching that when a person is not uh, is unable to um, overcome that which is making him bitter, which is generally his impulses towards negativity. So what should he do? There's several things that he can do. The first idea that uh, the person um, that the person should think about is drag himself into a deep intellectual learning, right? Drag your Yetzirah, your, your impulse towards negativity, called the Yetzirah, drag this impulse towards negativity into a place where you are focused intellectually on deep concepts that won't give your mind time to think about negative things. In other words, change the subject. Change the subject to that which you're thinking about. What causes bitterness is the way you think. So change the subject into thinking about other things and deeply thinking through things, important things, things that are not just um, um, irrelevant in, uh, in, in, in the bigger scheme of things. But think about important things and go deeply into such concepts. That's the first advice that the Talmud gives. The second thing the Talmud says is contemplate the oneness of God, that everything, uh, all of existence is part of God's oneness. There's nothing that stands outside of this. And there are specific meditations for that, but let's not get into them now. The third thing is, if, none, if, thou, if neither of those two work for whatever reason, contemplate, says the Talmud, contemplate the day of your death. Now, that would seem in and of itself a very morbid and bitter thing. But the point here is to contemplate the day of your death. How would you want to be mourned when you pass away? This is, this is what the, the Talmud says. How would you want to be mourned when you pass away? What, um, what would you want people to be saying about you when you pass away, when you're no longer able to change anything, and then work your way backwards from there. In other words, if you want to be, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> if you want to be remembered at your uh, funeral as a, oh, that old Kaja, I'm glad he's gone kind of thing, um, you know, that, uh, well, then, then don't do anything. But if you want to be remembered as that person who, uh, you know that saintly person, that kindly person, that 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 um, uh, humorous, per whatever it might happen to be. So you have to work your way way back. What do I have to do to achieve that particular thing? When one concentrates on that quite uh, strongly, it actually has it can have a very uh, positive and healing effect on a person because it gives you a direction. 
It gives a person a direction. Now, all of those are using the bitterness to cure the bitterness. Bitter concepts to cure the bitter, uh, the bitter ideas. However, there's one more opinion, that's the opinion of the Zohar. And the Zohar says that the eights, the tree that was thrown into the water, was in fact the tree of life. Now, <clears throat> what is the tree of life that was in uh, the Garden of Eden? What is the tree of life? So there are many different explanations in Kabbalah itself about what, uh, you know, what, what the tree of life represents. But the bottom line of all of them is that it's the idea of, of life, of enthusiasm, of being in the moment together with the um, de being in the moment together with the divine presence because that's what the Garden of Eden was all about. The Garden of Eden was about the divine presence. God says about the Garden of Eden, Bati Lagani, I have come to my garden, Lignuni, I've come to that place where I, in which I delight, where I was originally, so to speak. In other words, where, um, where God had planned for his divine presence to be revealed. In other words, in our existence, in the, in the existence of this world, but in the existence of a rectified world, which is what God had planned on uh, originally. So the tree of life, therefore, is the animating principle of that idea. The animating principle of making around us the Garden of Eden. Making around us that aspect of, uh, of life which is all good and all pure and all positive and all um, uh, energized due to the presence of due to the presence of God. It's opposite of the Eitz Adat. The Eitz Adat is what separates us from godliness. Eitz Chaim is what makes us cling to cling to God. Eitz Chaim Hilamachazikim Ba. It's a tree of life to those who cling to it to those who grasp hold of it. So therefore, um, the final opinion, the opinion of the Zohar is that what's important here is the concept of dveikut, cleaving to, chayim el yonim, cling, cleave, cleaving to a higher form of life, a higher aspect of life, cleaving to the tree of life in the Garden of Eden, cleaving to that which we can view ourselves, we can see ourselves as something higher than we are. In other words, cleaving to essentially what would be the root of the soul as it is up above. And that uh, is a complete healing of the bitterness of the waters. Then we'd be able to drink the waters uh, and they would, be indeed, uh, they would be indeed sweetened and sweetened completely. Okay.